So one of the first things people always ask when they're looking at system data is what's a good number, what's a bad number? The baseline is where you get that reference. When I'm running a class or a benchmarker, I don't have enough data to get a baseline yet. So in the workbook, I'm doing live tool first and then a baseline. But if I'm out at a site and already have the system installed and been running in production mode for the last month, I'd like to get the baseline first before I start actually looking at the live situation. Because when I'm live, I need to know how does this number fit into perspective for the last month, for example. And also as a benchmarker, I'm going to run the application a couple of times to get my first baseline before I start tuning it to figure out where is my current performance. Whether that's time to solution or teraflops performance, whatever it is you've determined as your quality of service metric. So I always like to have reference or baseline first. That's the hard part. Now, when I'm looking at my baseline data, I can generalize and imply some of my performance problems. Again, SAR and Performance Copilot have no real performance data in them, but they can indicate resources that are oversubscribed. And from that, I call it a leap of faith. And I can imply that there might be some sort of problem. So I want to talk about health of the system thresholds above which I expect that there's going to be a problem. And the first thing I've been looking at is the CPU utilization and the SAR-U type of metrics. I'm going to continue running these systems for about a month and be collecting data, but again, I'm not keeping the systems very busy right now. I did try to run things over the weekend and stuff like that, but unfortunately I ran them on Floyd 3 and I had not turned on Ganglia so I don't have a whole lot of data on Floyd 3 right now. Floyd 2 is the one that I did as, as a demo, I think. And I want to figure out where my user time is. So a lot of sites want to see their CPU utilization in user time all the time. But again, that doesn't mean that that user time is productive number crunching. It might be barrier synchronization problems, false cache sharing problems, TOB miss problems, and that's why I have to get into hardware counters. Uh, in the later module in application memory, we're just going to take a look at an application uh, that strides through the data in a row column versus column row and look at the time difference and look at the TLB misses on it. Then I need to get my system time baseline. Most people think that if I have more than 10% system time, I'd like to know what's going on. But nowadays with large CPU counts and large uh, CPU set situations where things are part of it, you might have something in eight CPUs on one socket that's 100% system time, but you don't see that in a global type of thing. And this is where I start using GSysmon instead of something like, I'm sorry, not GSysmon, my mistake. PMG Sys is what I'm thinking of. And PMG Sys will allow me to see the system down to the per CPU easily. MPI Viz is okay too, but that takes more work. And I have done things where I've reorganized my PMG Sys so I can spot the boot CPU set and the login CPU set. Because the hard part about PMG Sys is you can't tell what application, what CPU you're looking at or what application is running. And as the CPU counts get bigger in the system, the easier it is to create contention in the system time. I've got 40, 96 CPUs all trying to do a memory allocation or trying to do I.O., there's going to be spin lock contention. And I want to try to show that later in demo. Also, I want to look at memory utilization, but again, the hard part here is in the CPU set situation. You could have one application using all this memory and pushing to swap, and the rest of the system has no memory being used. So we're really not breaking memory out on a per CPU set basis. And there is a uh, PMP 
TCP PMCD set of metrics on a per node basis. One of the things I don't like about PMG Sys is it gives me a, a system memory utilization, but not a per socket memory utilization. So I've written my own PMG Sys that would give me a, kind of like node info, give me a GUI for how the sockets are doing on memory utilization. It, it's easy to write a PM gadget scene that can give me memory free on a per socket basis. That's a real easy thing to do. After I've got my baseline on health of the system metrics, then I need to look at my quality of service metrics. And again, this is the hard part. Without CSA accounting, with PBS, all I get is wall clock time and user time. I don't really get aisle weights. I don't get trim weights. I don't get any IO bytes transferred or anything like that. There's a lot of useful information that the task stack interface can give to me. And without CSA, I can't really plot and look at which process is spending the most time trimming memory, which process is spending the most amount of time in the kernel, that sort of thing. And I also had my SPV tool that will plot PBS data. And we were looking at that in an earlier example, my SPV going to PBS, and I do have PBS data on my Floyd 3 that I'd look, like to look at real quickly with SPV. So first of all, Linux and these systems are not meant to be oversubscribed. You, basically, if CPU utilization is close to 100%, start looking for problems. These are cache-based machines nowadays. If you're at 100% utilization, you are likely crashing on something, and your CPU utilization is going up, but your throughput is going down, and your elapsed time or CPU service times are getting longer because now you're thrashing on things that are not visible in a CPU utilization. The other thing you want is your run queue, the SARDASH queue, not the load level, because the load level includes IO weights. But SARDASH queue is the running and runnable processes. You want that to be less than the number of CPUs you have. So SARDASH queue is the run queue length, which are processes running on a CPU or runnable, meaning they're not waiting or sleeping on some WCHAN event. And again, with a proc sked debug, you can look at each CPU's run queue to see that every CPU has only one thing on the run queue. If you start driving up your run queues and stuff, one of the first things that happens is your multi-threaded applications communication overhead goes up, what I call a bar barrier sticking. The other thing that's going to start happening is the caches on the socket, on the core, I should say, start thrashing. There's an L1, L2, and L3, and you start getting on-chip cache thrash because I load the cache with my data, CPU scheduler disconnects me, somebody else comes in, warms the cache with their data, I come back and now I have to rewarm my cache again because they polluted the cache with their data. Now if that other process was just an interrupt handler or something, it's not going to pollute the cache, but it still interrupted me. And one of the things that other thread, even if it's not uh, cache intensive, could have done is resulted in an instruction pipeline flush. The other thing that could be happening is thread hopping and this is what's bothering me right now. The latest kernels, I'm seeing the migration threads real high in top. And again, I'm deliberately oversubscribing and causing the migration thread to be busy, whereas it would be better to CPU set everything, deplace everything, and pin everything down and basically turn off the CPU scheduler and say, every thread has affinity, leave me alone, don't bounce me around. So even if I'm in a CPU set, I still want to pin within the CPU set so that I'm always on the same core and I'm not bouncing to a different core and then have to rewarm the cache on that core. And again, instruction pipeline flushes, if I'm branching around or context switching, suddenly a new thread comes in and all of my instructions might be thrown away. Now that depends on the processor. For example, in a hyper-thread situation, 
two threads can interleave and overlap in the instruction pipe. One of the things we're getting into hardware counters again, if I got my routine C lint 100% of the time, I'm still going to go into hardware counters and look for TOB misses, cache misses. Uh, I'm going to look for false cache sharing events. I'm also going to look at instruction pipeline flushes and find where in the program I keep flushing the pipe, meaning that there was a jump or a context switch and everything that I had in the pipe was thrown away. Now, again, in hyperthreads, they can interleave, and that reduces what I'm calling a micro no-op. So one of the tuning things you do in the hardware counters is to find where all your micro no-ops are. Instruction might take eight clock periods to run. That would mean there are eight micro operations for that instruction to get completed. Something called software pipelining done by the compiler is trying to shuffle the instructions and pack all those micro ops, all those instruction micro ops slots in the instruction pipe so that we don't have any wasted clock periods where micro operations are not occurring. But if I am jumping and flushing the instruction pipe, I'm going to have a lot more no micro op. In other words, it used to be called a bubble, but a wasted clock period where something in one of the instruction pipes did not complete. Last I looked, there were like 11 instruction pipes, and nowadays they call it a reservation station. The other thing that's going to happen as my CPU utilization goes up is now I'm going to start waiting for a CPU. So I can make the system 100% busy, but now my CPU wait time is going to go up. And again, get delays can attach to it. And in particular, the multi-threading applications and OpenMP and that SCED yield is going to result in CPU wait time. So sometimes it's a natural effect of multi-threading. If I don't want to wait for a CPU, I want to use it or block on it, sleep on it. After I look at CPU utilization, then I look at the IO wait times. And this you have to be careful of as well, because on a large CPU system, I might have eight CPUs that are busy doing IO and creating a huge uh, file system buffer cache problem where maybe half my memory is dirty and I don't see the IO wait because it's only on four CPUs on a 4096 CPU system. You can have severe IO wait problems, but it's not visible system wide on a uh, consolidated total for the system. Now, IO wait time is on data IO wait. In particular, in WCHAN, there are things like block congestion, sync page, get request. There's some NFS underscore wait, things like that. And bottom line, when the kernel prints to the slash proc PID WCHAN field, it goes through the stack trace of the process, the sleeping process, and looks at the subroutines. And if the subroutine is in a generic address range where the common kernel subroutines are, it does not print it. And the main lock that is counted as I await is called IO underscore SCED. Oops. In older kernels, when you looked at WCHAN, you'd be able to see the IO underscore SCED. But now it prints out and says, well, if everything's IO underscore SCED, that doesn't mean much to me because it's generic. So they go up the stack trace and print the next one that is not in that general common subroutine area of the kernel or, or in the general lock subroutine area. You can go into the uh, slash proc source code and find where it writes WCHAN and says, if the address is in this generic range, don't print it. Go to the next routine in the stack. So when I do see IO wait, whether it's MPVIS, PMG SIS, or TOP, WCHAN, or PSWCHAN, I want to know what's waiting on IO. 
And I'll do a PS-L and look at the W chance and maybe echo a T in the Proxys RQ trigger to find what, see the whole stack to find out what's in there. I do have to warn you, there are a lot of times where W chan is not being printed out correctly from the kernel, where I see the process of sleeping with an S in the state field, but there's nothing in the W chan field and it's a dash. So again, you do have to be careful about the interpretation of W chan, where there are times where it is sleeping, but there's nothing being printed out into the W chan field. And I was seeing that in the, the uh, week that we were running the class a couple weeks ago. So when I do see I08, one of the things I'll do is bring up top disk to see if I've got a busy disk. There is IOSTAT-X to be able to see if, if I've got any busy disk. And then I look at the WCHAN field. And again, even more nowadays, I will do an echo. So I was out of sight and had this happen. System performance was slow. Saw how I await. And then I did an echo P into slash proc slash sysrq trigger. And then in var log messages, in D message or slash var log messages, I get the kernel stack trace of everything that was in a sleep state, and then I can find the ones that were in an IO SCED and see how I got there and see what the process is. And in one case, it was uh, NFS IO weight that everything was stuck on. And then we saw all the memory was dirty. I should say 50% of the memory was dirty, and that was what was creating contention for the users. And keep in mind, if my NFS I.O. path is highly contented for because of NFS data, every time I do a command, if a NFS home directory is in my path, it's going to have to compete with that dirty data being written to be able to get the command found because it's going to go through my path. And you want to make sure your path is clean. That's why if I have a load problem, I'm not going to log in as DAW and then SU to root because then DAW's home directory is in my path still. Even though I've SU'd the root, it all still has dependency upon my initial shell where my I.O. is coming back to. So WCHAN or SysRQ trigger sleep traces are very useful for me or popping up a crash and looking at an individual process. But usually I want to see more than one process. That's why I like an echo T and a sysrq trigger. Now you do have to be careful and wait for it to finish. And one of the other things that the T will print out is the sked debug, slash proc slash sked debug to show me what's on each CPU. So thirdly, if the CPUs are okay, but the IO weight is high, then I'm going to look for swap. SAR dash big W will give me swap IO. And it's kind of hard to show here. I got a little bit of a syntax format problem here. But when I, I want to try to do swapping today in the next module, but swap often shows up as a get request or a sync page. So when I do have swap, it's not always easy to find out what's doing the swap. I don't have a tool that will print out the swap map to say me how many pages are out on swap on a per process basis. And the other thing is with SAR R, being able to look at my memory utilization and looking at that stack bar uh, memplot that I was doing in stacking the slab, the dirty, the right back, the clean, the buff mem, and on pages, mapped, free. Now, one thing, some sites turn off swap. I don't advise that. I would rather have a huge swap than hitting the out of memory killer. So we can talk about that when we get into the memory module. So here I'm just looking at the SAR U report. CPU utilization looks healthy. I do have high system time, though, so I perf top, 
might be helpful to tell me. Top sys might be helpful in telling me what that system time is. Then somewhere, what do we got here? And by the way, note here, look at my timestamps. One second, one second, one second. And then there was a 30 second stall where SAR and SADC couldn't even get into the system to run. And then right after that, we started getting I08. I want to go to my uh, slide here. I talked about this in an earlier module. Bottleneck chart. Time. Let's just say in seconds. Number of procs. As my load goes up, I eventually am going to have some sort of quality of service de degradation here. We'd like to operate the system down in here. By the way, nowadays these bottleneck curves really don't look like a bottleneck anymore because we've got so many CPUs. Nowadays it kind of just goes out straight and then hits the wall. But I was talking about this the other day. When I'm on an overcommitted machine, and that's what we're seeing here, this system was operating in a portion of the bottleneck curve that was close to death. So a small runtime variance here caused a big variance in what I'm looking at. And I use the word smearing, and that's kind of what I'm seeing. I'm seeing my data smear here in the workbook example. So right in there. I had a stall that's usually due to some sort of I.O. or buffer cache contention. Notice the system time went away and then we started getting with an I.O. wait. So during system time I'd be using perf top and top sys to look at that. During the I.O. wait I'd have to find the W chans and figure out what process is doing an I.O. wait and then look at the I.O. path. And the advances admin class gets into the I.O. path and profiling the I.O. Dave? Yeah. Is there something to be concerned about? Only two seconds. It only happened two, two seconds, right? Well, I got 30 seconds that was missing here. Oh, okay. 30 seconds that I lost data, doing one-second samples. So I'm just saying there are cases where when I'm oh. looking at that I might actually but be I able thought to you, you you do a SAR one. And why why we skip thirty seconds here? Because the system was too busy to do anything. Oh. Or oh, even SAR skip a thirty seconds. Correct. We're dropping data. The SADC command could not run and collect any data. Oh, and you I, have to I, look I, at I all your resources, but in this case, I suspect okay. it was a stock situation. Okay. If you're in PCP, it'll start blanking out where you're dropping data. So I'm just saying when I am on that bottleneck, the tip of the bottleneck, when I'm operating up in here, I'm going to start losing data or data is going to start being distorted. And I just happen to have caught a, a distortion example due to the workload. So whatever happened in here resulted when it was done in the I await going up. This is what I'm going to talk about this uh, in the second week, but I, in this example is what I call cache domination, where something is holding all of the page cache busy and I can't get a buffer cache buffer to run. One of the things that's happening here is, uh, uh, just knowing from the data in the example here, I filled up all my memory and started swapping. And when I hit the out, when I hit the out of physical memory, I started trimming the cache. And once I started trimming the cache, I threw away shared text. My executables are in the cache portion. And if I'm in a swap, even before I'm in the swap situation, when I'm out of memory, I'm going to push down the slab first and then the page cache. And once the page cache gets to zero, all my executables are thrown away. 
and now I can't get the Bass Shell or SADC to run because they're off on route. In this case, route was busy with Swap IO. So I threw them away, and then I have to go back to get them on a device that was busy from the Swap IO. That's what happened in this case. So when you are getting into that out of physical memory, you're going to trim the kernel down, the slab, then you're going to trim the page cache, then you're going to start swapping. But there's a window between trimming the page cache before you start swapping where the cache is zero size, all your executables have been released from memory, and you're so busy swapping now that you can't get those executables back into memory. Or just as bad, the application has all the memory and is not able to get the cache to grow enough to bring in the executable. Does that make sense? So some people say swap I.O. is bad, but in fact, it's not so much the swap I.O. It's the fact that I push the cache down to zero, and I'm fighting to hold my executables in memory because memory is being dominated by something else that's holding the memory busy, such as the application or dirty, right back, NFS unstable data holding memory busy. And I can't get memory to be able to bring in my executable. And I might not even be swapping and still have that cache domination problem. So that's what happened here. I basically ran memhog, created the swap situation, but there was a 30-second window in there where the slab and the cache were trimmed down to nothing, and they're dominating the memory, and my executables and DSOs get thrown away. So that type of activity would, would cause us SAR to to not print in output? Correct. And huh. PM chart would also start dropping data. Top wouldn't run because you can't even get top in. You try to run top, but it's trying to go to root to get the executable, but it's also trying to grow the, the cache to be able to bring that executable in. And here the application is trying to trim the cache, and then we're trying to grow the cache to load our executables or our data sets, and the two are fighting. In fact, during this interval, if I'd looked at a SAR-B for trims and then a SAR-Big W for swaps, and that might have indicated what's happening. Oh. There's also BC-free, which throws away the cache, and immediately after BC-free, you immediately see all the executables and the DSOs reread back into memory. So I just was trying to show a case here, but I actually did happen to catch a stall situation. Let me move on. Yeah. So again, reviewing the metrics, we have the user time, and we're going to profile that with perf top or PS run, things of that sort. Nice time, any user CPU utilization that is running under a nice, a low priority. Uh, batch queues, for example, might have a low pri queue. Also, cron events, such as the find for the locate utility, might be running under a nice. Then we have our system time, time spent in the kernel, and that's where we're going to use perf top, top sys. But again, I also want to get into the uh, memory allocation problem and do a butterfly report on the system time, be able to see how I got to a spin lock. Then we had our IOA, time spent could be used except processes are waiting on I.O. I kind of lost it, it looks like here. Could be used except processes wait are waiting on I.O. instead. And by the way, that I.O. wait does include swap I.O. And I was mentioning with my WCHAN some of the different lock names, and they change from kernel to kernel. And again, it is the I.O. underscore sked lock that is being anything that is sleeping on an I.O. underscore sked is counted as I await. Now, if there's no idle, then I await is not counted, but still could be a problem. Then idle time, and then steel again was for virtualization, guest operating system. And ICEX, the admin node, is using virtualization. So Tempo is actually running as a guest under the appliance OS. And I need to add into here to make it clearer that is 
is no idle time. If I do have idle time, the virtualization or the guest is counted as system time. So your guest operating system could be the con be, could be the result of system time until you run up idle. Then counting that guest operating system time will show up as steal. So you got some application that's in the guest, pure CPU bound, doing work in user space, but it shows up as system because it's running under the guest. So you got to watch out for that on the tempo admin note, the uh, HA system admin controller. Next one I have here, SAR-R, we have the amount of memory free, the amount of memory being used. Again, this is not on a per node basis, this is not on a per CPU basis. Again, for me, one of the hardest things in looking and analyzing big systems is I got to consolidate the data down, but then I got to pull it apart to a per CPU set and then per process, per, uh, excuse me, start off per CPU set, then per socket, then per process. So during this interval, my memory is 50% used, the other 50% is not allocate, allocated. Remember, KD buffers is raw I.O., anything in slash dev. Uh, XFS DB, XFS defraggers, make FS, make swap, uh, database engines. We're bypassing the file system. We are not doing any super block directory inode lookups. We're going straight into raw flat space. I had one site that was doing an MD5 sum on their file system. And when it ended up slash dev, it would generate a checksum on SDA. And it would read the entire SDA in the memory. And then what's the first thing you gotta do? Throw it away. Also associated with large buffers is the buffer underscore head in the slab. So when you have a large buffer, for example, if I read in a 100 gigabyte drive on a 100 gigabyte system, my slab is going to grow, the buffer head's going to grow to describe that raw buffer I.O. chain that I just read into memory. Then we have our cached field. Now lately the cache field is including the slab. So again, I want to review this at this point. I'm going to go to my uh, whiteboard here. So I have a slash proc slash mem info cache field. And in there, we first of all have dirty data, which is a write by application to disk. Still in memory, incoherent, lost on service interruption. And this is, by the way, all block I.O. This is block I.O., meaning that it's blocked typically 5, 12 byte block. Then we go into write back, which is marked to flush, waiting on IO, a flush in Fortran, a sync. a uh, wash demon threshold and we're, we'll talk about dirty underscore background underscore ratio or dirty expire centiseconds. If 
I get more than, for example, 5% of my memory dirty or it's been dirtier than 30 seconds, we'll also start flushing data, and then the dirty data gets marked to write back. Now, if we're writing to NFS, then it is marked as NFS unstable. And then once it's flushed, it is then cache clean. Coherent. Flush is done or was a read. Now, TCP derives Oops. Clean by taking cached minus the dirty in the right back. So you don't have a cache clean in ProcMem info that is being computed as being cached minus the dirty, minus the right backer. You know, the two are actually, uh, let me, and I have an RFE. It should also subtract the NFS unstable from it, but it, that was not available at the time that PCP implemented the cache clean. Also in the cache now was tempfs which, by the way, includes slash dev, shmem, also IPCS, the shem CTL system call IPC stuff, and it includes the shared text, executables, and DSOs. So again, when I have run out of memory and I push my slab down as far as I can, then I'm going to try to trim the cache. And when I push the cache down to zero, all my executables with DSOs are also flushed. And a BC free would flush the clean and the shared text. BC free by default will not touch dirty or write back NFS or tempfs IPC stuff. There is a BC free dash S to flush the dirty in the right back and force a sink. But by default, BC free can only free up the clean and the shared text. Now, one last thing to warn you here now. Let's see. Top free SAR add the slab reclaimable to the cache field. So you can see a big cache field That's on top. what you'd write now. Question? I cannot see what you'd write. It's on. Um, okay, do you see anything? Yeah, outside of this, this screen. Do you see anything, my ProcMem info cache field? Do you see anything? No, it's only only up to IPCS. Okay, well, it should catch up by now. So after IPCS, I've got shared text, and then pointing out that in top and free and star, we're adding the slab reclaimable to the cache field. Well, if it hasn't caught up, I don't know. I'm going to move on anyways. Yeah. So I'm just reviewing what's in the cache field. Let me go back to the baseline here. So I've got a cache field, uh, looks like almost a gig in this case. And then notice here the cache got trimmed, the slab or the buffers got trimmed. We can see that the CP utilization actually went up in this area. And where we're doing uh, 20, 24, 25, 26, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14. 
Uh, it looks like it's actually two second samples, not one second samples. Looks like I cheated on the value here. Looks like I'm getting two every time. I was just wondering if that's the same interval, 558. Yeah, it's a different interval than we were looking at before. Anyway, after KB cash, just commit and percent commit. I'm going to talk about this in the next module on memory. These are meaningless numbers. The commit is what I reserved, but by default we can over-reserve memory. So notice here, I have more reservations than I have virtual memory. But because overcommit is a zero, I can overcommit my machine. In Irix days, we called it virtual swap and on. In Linux, by default, we can overcommit, oversubscribe our memory. I can reserve more than I have virtual memory. So this is the ratio of my reservation versus my virtual memory size. And I want to save that discussion more for the memory module coming up. But this, this is a meaningless number. I wish it wasn't even on this particular slide. Moving on. Oh, I guess I do have a pretty good description here. Dirty, shamam, right back. You've got to add in the slab now. The slab is nowadays being added in there as well. So make a note of that. And then the commit is the amount of memory that's been reserved or malloc. And then the percent commit is the ratio of virtual memory reserved. And I got my swap, dash capital S. How much of my swap is free, how much it is used, percentage used. And then we've got something called swap cached. This is where the data exists both in memory's cache and out on swap. So say I read, uh, well, anyway, say I generate a shared memory segment, maybe in Deb Shemem. Then I run out of memory, so I have to trim the memory. And when I push the slab down as far as I can, and then push the slab down as far as I can, then I'm going to start swapping Dev Shemem, and that will go out to the swap device. Then maybe my application comes along, my memory shortage is done, and now I read a page that's out on swap that's in Dev Shemem, and that page will come back into memory, but we will not release it from swap. That way, if I have to trim it, I don't have to swap it out. And then if I hit the page again, and tr and uh, I don't have to go out to swap, I don't have to swap it out. I may trim it, throw it away, but I'm reducing the swap outs. Anyway, it's usually Dev Shemem or TempFS or IPCS that will exist both out on swap and in the cached field. And by the way, we never swap executables, DSOs, or process uh, shared text. Those are not swapped. They are simply released and then reread from the file system like slash bin when we need them again. You never swap the executables. So we got swap free. Swap use, which includes swap shemem, and then swap cached, where it's on swap and in cache, which can include the shemem. Bottleneck indication. So if my run queue divided by the number of CPUs is greater than one, I'm going to have CPU contention. I'm going to have barrier problems. I'm going to have cache sharing problems. I'm going to have uh, cache misses. I'm going to have CPU wait time. With memory, if star dash big W shows processes swapped in, I don't like that. Again, there is a get delays. That counts the time we wait on swap, uh, swap in IO. So we actually time how long those process swap ins are taking on a per process basis. Again, if star dash s is showing that my swap has allocations, I might have problems there. Bar log messages is going to indicate if my memory is a problem, if I'm hitting out of memory killers. Or you might get user complaints. Again, if I run out of memory, 
The out of memory killer, I want to demonstrate this in the next, in the memory module, but I might get a kill, but I could also get segmentation faults. So for example, in our prior uh, demo, we did have an out of memory event that resulted in syslog D. There was no kill message in var log messages, but there were segmentation faults. There were probably a core file sitting around somewhere, assuming core files are turned on. For disk, SAR-D, my rule of thumb is I want the wait time and the service time in milliseconds. If it's greater than 60, I'm going to look to see if my I.O. is clean and efficient, and that's part of the advances admin class. And if my percent utilization is greater than 30%, then I want to see if my uh, disk drives are being productively used or they're thrashing on heads or something like that. Also, if DF is showing that I get more than 85% full, that can result in file fragmentation. And in the advances admin class, we talk about XFS and delayed allocation to try to avoid fragmentation. And if I'm running out of disk space, XFS tries harder and harder to avoid fragmentation up front, which will throttle back your I.O., and your I.O. wait times will go up because XFS is trying to avoid writing a fragmented file and saying, okay, I'd rather take the overhead now to write and to avoid fragmentation than just be sloppy, write a fragmented file, then live with reading that fragmented file forever. So if my file systems are filling up, fragmentation is going to be a problem. Also in var log messages, I can see if file system full conditions are occurring, and also user complaints like no space left on device or can't create a file. Don't forget about DF-I. DF-I showing me the number of I nodes. And if DF-I is showing me with NFS and everything that I have 100 million I nodes, I can expect problems with the slab, with find running, things of that sort. So this is my bottleneck analysis. My quality of service over here is my uh, number of workload units, where there are number of CPUs or whatever. And then over here might be the elapsed time, the response time, or expansion factor turnaround ratio is the uh, CPU time over the service time. So I've got two thresholds here. When I'm greater than the number of CPUs, I'm going to start having problems. And eventually, I'm going to hit a process limit, and that's when forks will fail. And basically, up here is what I call infinity. Things are killed, and I never get my answer back. So as the workload unit count goes up, and I'm not saying that I'm running one application more threads wide. I'm running multiple parallel concurrent occurrences of the application. So as the thread count goes up, I'm going to start seeing system time due to contention between the threads. For example, they might have I.O. weight or I.O. in them and then start spinning on an I.O. spin lock, writing. Maybe that system time is going to go up due to memory allocation, things of that sort. At some point, I start increasing due to cache thrash effects. This is usually due to noise coming in from check config demons. This is one of the reasons we do a boot CPU set to keep all the operating system noise away from the check config demons. So when I sell a 4096 CPU system, I'm, not, I'm going to try to set expectations that you don't always want to go 4096 threads wide because some of your threads are going to have contention from check config demons, and the multi-threaded barrier is going to stick because of lots of different contention effects. And the other thing is my number of workload units goes up is thread hopping. And in this latest kernel, I'm seeing the migration thread high CPU time. I'm going to expect to see that in our memory demo coming up. Once I have my number of running processes greater than the number of CPUs, then my barriers are going to start sticking. OpenMP and MPI are going to have severe problems. And I'm also going to have CPU wait time. And then once I hit 
the maximum number of processes that limit or U limit give me, or kernel dot dash max, or the other one nowadays is max PID. which often has to be increased on large CPU systems. I think the largest can go is like 999999, and when you hit that, that's the largest that the process table can get to, and then forks start failing because there's no process table space. Now, the second week, the advances admin class begins with a process fork storm and actually hits that limit and watch what happens there. We move on for memory. Question? No. For memory, as I get more and more threads, the first thing that's going to start being contention is allocation time. The more and more cores I have on a socket, the more contention on these sockets. Memory allocation spin lock. We can allocate only one thread at a time on a socket. So if I have 12 cores on a socket, they cannot all allocate concurrently at the same time in parallel. They're going to start spinning on a lock. And this is what I'm trying to look at now on systems nowadays and be able to see the uh, raw spin lock system time go up and be able to prove that that is from allocation, not from system calls, but from TLB misses that result in an allocation of memory. At some point from that allocation time, the malics and the S-brakes themselves will start stalling. And then when we hit physical memory, we're going to start paging to swap. Paging to swap is going to result in some idle time and an I.O. wait time. Again, swap I.O. shows up as I.O. wait. Now, I don't have a problem with paging out to swap. It's paging in from swap. The paging out to swap is in the background. But if my process takes hits a TOB miss and has to go to swap to get to it, now I'm paging in from swap, and that is counted but with get delays. There's a swap I.O. wait time there. Then I start getting a little bit further, and this is what I want to demo after the memory module. Then my system time starts going up due to the out-of-memory killer. So when I start hitting all of my memory and all of my swap allocated, I have to start killing. And this is where some sites will run a uh, system daemon that will look for uh, processes that are hogging memory and kill them before the out-of-memory killer comes into place. If we're hitting out-of-memory killer situations, our system's going to be unstable. The out-of-memory killer is not very smart at what it kills. In the latest releases, it will kill everything within a CPU set. If there's nothing in that CPU set to kill, you're in trouble. I had a site that was basically no swap configured, zero swap. They would submit four jobs, MATLAB, for example. The user would ask for more memory than they needed. They didn't specify CPU, so they got like one socket but then the application used more memory than was available on that socket. So PBS Pro would create, or in this case it was Torque Moab, would create a CPU set for that socket and the memory on that socket. There was no swap, so when four jobs ran out of memory in that socket, in that node, it would hit the out-of-memory killer on a per CPU set basis. And four jobs and four CPU sets hitting the out-of-memory killer at the same time stormed Varlog messages, and the system was unusable for more than half an hour as the out-of-memory killer event was going on. And occasionally you might in top see syslog D high on the list. So when we run, when we've allocated all our memory and all of our swap, the out-of-memory killer comes in, and I'm going to discuss that in the memory module. And the the out-of-memory killer DM has to start scanning pages and figuring out, okay, who can I kill? And the bigger the system, the more system time to scan all the pages. And then at some point we start getting kills. 
and the out of memory killer. Uh, you might see only system time in a CPU set, not system wide, and then the kill. Any questions on that? Again, or do you measure uh, allocation time? The allocation time, we can only allocate one thread on a socket at a time. There is a generic spin lock on a per node basis. So if I have 12 threads all trying to allocate on the same socket at the same time, there's going to be system time in contention for that. Most oh, okay. of the allocation time will show up as system time. I want to try to demonstrate this when we get into the memory module. Okay. Also, some people will try to allocate the array space the way it's going to be multi-threaded. So somebody might have done just a single calic clearing out the space in a non-multi-thread aware situation, and that didn't have contention on the lock. But now they've made it a uh, iterative do loop that's going to do parallel OpenMP the same way as it's going to be post-processed so that we get affinity. And now we might have 12 threads trying to allocate at the same time, and now my allocation time and my system time is going to go up because of contention on that lock. I think that's what I'm seeing in a lot of these cases right now, and I want to try to replicate that. And again, in perf top, I'm going to see a spin lock IRQ type of uh, kernel routine. But since it's not a system call, I need to get into a call graph to be able to see how I got to that spin lock time. And I want to try to uh, demonstrate that in an application memory demo. Okay. Did that ask, ask, answer your question? Yeah. So let's come back to memory in the memory module. With disk, first of all, when I'm uh, creating the file, there's going to be allocation and deallocation time. There's going to be file creation time. There's going to be journal wait time. So when I get into a metadata intensive situation, or for example, if a file is a video file that I'm reading from a a satellite or something, the file is growing, and if the file grows, I've got to make journal act, act transactions, and I can get journal wait time in there. This one thing nice about the extended three, it has no memory limit for its journals. The journals show up as buff mem, and XFS is limited to the number of buffers that it can keep track of in memory for journaling activity. You can get into a metadata situation, for example, an email spam attack or Varspool news, where I have a lot of inode wait time or metadata wait time or journal wait time, and WCHAN will show that. You can also have file unlink time to remove the inode. And if there is still dirty memory, we're going to have to talk about this in the advances admin class. If I write a file and it's still dirty, I can remove the inode, and the inode is gone, but the flushing is still occurring. The disk space is still being used until the actual flush is finished, and then the file can be released from memory, and then you get your memory back, and you get your disk space back. That's something that I will demonstrate in the second week. As the disk capacity gets full, my allocation time is going to go up because, again, XFS tries to avoid fragmentation. This will show up as an IO wait time, the AV wait in star dash D will start going up as it tries to allocate in a least fragmented situation. Now, we need to talk about allocation groups. And it basically is going to sit there trying to stay in the same allocation group and try to get the file allocated contiguously. If I have 10,000 allocation groups, my allocation group might be too small for me to keep that file in there. And now I start looking for other allocation groups. If an allocation group fills up, then I go to another allocation group to find contiguous space. If I have a ton of allocation groups, now I'm spinning around all these allocation groups that are too small, 
and now I'm going to start getting into problem of allocation time. Now that has to be discussed in the advances admin class when we talk about XFS. And of course, at some point we hit all system full conditions, no space left on device, and we get kills. Buffer cache, page cache, is also a finite resource. They, uh, developers seem to think that whenever I want, I can get a buffer cache buffer when in fact that is not true. You can get into contention on the buffer cache. In fact, that example that I showed you earlier where it stalled out for a minute was contention on the buffer cache. So everything has a finite capacity, including the page cache. And I need to talk about this in the second week, but one of the things is I can get into a buffer cache thrash situation. I read the file in, then I allocate memory to process it, copy it into an array or something like that, and during the allocation, I end up trimming the page cache that I just read the file in. Back in early Altex days when the node was small, an application would come in, read the file into that node's memory, then allocate memory on that node and throw away everything it just read in, and then it would hit the data, have to reread it in, and you can get in the situation where I read it into memory, trim it, read it into memory, trim it, read it into memory, and get into a cache thrash situation, a page cache thrash situation. Now, my interactive response is okay during this type of event, but my application is doing bad with heavy I.O. weight. And one of the indications of a buffer cache thrash problem is if I'm trimming a lot and a SAR dash capital B basically SAR dash little b and big b can indicate if I'm in a buffer cache thrash situation. I call this an upside down cache. Basically my physicals to disk are more than my logicals because I have to keep going back to disk and reread the file because once I load it into memory it gets trimmed and thrown away right away. And I sit there thrashing. So one of the things that SGI does is set the CPU set memory spread page cache and memory spread slab to prevent filling up everything on a single node. We spread it across the nodes so that when I read the file in, I'm not going to have a memory pressure and a memory trim on a per node basis. The disadvantage to that, though, is that now I've got latency impact and Numalink traffic going across the interconnect to get to all the page cache. So there are cases where you want to have your file read in, not in a round robin across the nodes, but just on your node. And this is the latency versus, or locality versus bandwidth, uh, latency versus bandwidth, a first touch versus round robin. And I said, if my assets can stay on node, I want first touch, and I would turn off the memory spreads in the CPU set. If I can't hold both all of my assets and my application on a per node basis, then I start spreading it round robin or doing interleaves. Another contention problem on the buffer cache is heavy writes. Again, half my memory can go dirty, and dirty memory cannot be allocated or used until it has flushed the disk and is coherent. And especially if I have high write backs. If write backs or NFS unstable, are high, that's going to be a problem. I'm not going to be able to get memory from those things. If I'm writing to an NFS server, a 10 gig file, or let's say a 100 gig file, and I'm a 100 gig memory, 50 gig of that thing is going to sit in memory and then I can't get memory from that thing. This is what I call write domination. The writes are dominating memory, and I can't get memory because this thing has taken all the memory. One of the things that really needs to happen in the kernel is handling dirty memory on a per CPU set basis. I could have my application come in, grab two sockets, write that 100 gig file, and all of my memory in the CPU set might go dirty, 
and the flushing won't start until I get a 30-second timestamp, until the date is 30 seconds old. And now my interactive response is really horrible because I can't allocate memory because it's all busy from writes. It's all dirty or write back or NFS unstable. Another effect, particularly in a large CPU system, a cord op storm. If I'm 4096 wide and I take a segmentation fault, I'm going to possibly generate 4096 cores depending upon the sysctl parameter that says whether I use the PID on the core file. So if the limit command allows me to do a core dump and sysctl has created uh, core dumps that have PIDs in them, I'm going to get, for example, 4096 cores and that's going to stall out your system and dominate your memory, dominate your page cache with core dumps. And system's going to be unusable. And eventually you can get in the situation where all of my memory is busy. Uh, it could all be shamam, dirty, right back NFS unstable, and I can't get anything out of the system. Usually in this situation I can ping the interface, but I can't log in. I can't get message of the day to work. I can't get the login into memory. And again, in this situation, my page cache might be down to zero. So I can't use all memory because my applications have pushed the page cache down to zero. And during a trim situation as well, the page cache is being shrunk, so I can't grow it while I'm trying to shrink it. So this is another situation where I talk about page cache domination where the trim is trying to get rid of the page cache, but then something's trying to grow the page cache to be able to read in, for example, a shared text. And if my cache is at zero, the login command, the bash command, the, the itsy message of the day will not be in memory. Now, I'm kind of dreaming right now, but on IRIX, there was a command called buff view that showed a top for the page cache. And when I had buff view, I could see core dump stores. I could see what was thrashing on the buffer cache. I could see the write pollution. I could see cache domination. All those sorts of things were easy to identify. And 30 years ago, before I had buff view, I used to have to dump the buffer underscore head and figure out who's using it all. The day I saw buff view in IREX, I said, it's like seeing God. It immediately showed me what was creating my page cache problems. And I could see page cache thrash, I could see page cache domination, I could see a core dump storm, I could see write pollution. Buff view was a top of the buffer header chain. And that was really, really nice in its day. The buffer cache is a finite resource and can be oversubscribed and overcommitted. Now, wrapping up here, once I've done my baseline, then I can start setting my threshold. Now, we talked about this in the PCP module, but uh, this is obsolete now. ESP is gone. So you can set thresholds with PMIE comp. There's a help in there. Then I can enable and disable rules, turn them on or off, or in particular, I can modify a threshold. So I did a rules, and one of the thresholds I often might do is CPU utilization being low or a per CPU, uh, let's see, for example, these two I might also turn off. And there's nothing in here on uh, context switches. But I might say on a per CPU basis, if my uh, system time gets high, let me know or in particular, contact switches from a barrier synchronization or SCED yield storm. So after I've got my baseline, then I can set my rules and start saying, how do I want to set my threshold? So in this case, we're just saying high CPU utilization. On compute servers, I want it to be high. And again, this doesn't take into account uh, CPU sets and stuff like that where I might have low CPU utilization, but a CPU set still has a problem. So in the VAR PCB config PMIE comp, this is where the templates for the rules are. And in here, there was a rule example 
and basically the action is separated by this, and the default action is, say, right into syslog, once every 10 minutes, you got high CP utilization. Now, you can also change that alarm to be a GUI X11 that will pop up or run a script or write something to the serial console. So I could write a rule to say if my context switches go above a million, do a PS-E or something like that, and then write a message into the console. So you got four actions when a alarm goes off with PMIE. So bottom line, I want to look at the system and try to look as much SAR data as possible. I'd like from a week to a month. Then I've got SAR-R data for memory, SAR-W for swapping. I'll use PM longer data to check for I.O. And again, that can get rather large in a failover situation. I might use accounting data to get my top commands. And from there, I start setting my thresholds once I know what the system looks like over the past month. Uh, again, ganglia I'll often use in a baseline scenario as well. Unfortunately, Floyd 3 that I've been running work on has not had instrumentation turned on, so I don't have more than seven days of SAR. I didn't have any ganglia data. I just had CSA data. So in lab, I normally look at a month's worth of SAR data on the system. I install ganglia and get it working. I get my CSA data. I look at PBS data, and then I set my thresholds. And again, I have a special script I wrote for proof of concept to plot my SAR, PCP, and PBS data, and then figure out what is my typical resource consumption on these systems. With that, I want to take a break here.